Welcome to the Mothman in the Bible Belt Podcast with your host, Buck Fantastic. Cookies. Fracking is a word synonymous with horizontal, unconventional oil and natural gas drilling. The industry touts record profits, reliable energy, and job creation as some of fracking's many benefits. While critics of this oil and natural gas extraction practice cite numerous concerns such as air and water pollution, sound pollution, traffic, property damage, and the release of the powerful greenhouse gas methane as to why it should be banned. Environmental freelance journalist Justin Noble breaks down fracking on this week's episode of the Mothman in the Bible Belt podcast. In January of 2020, Noble's Rolling Stone expose on fracking titled America's Radioactive Secret caught the eyes of millions of Americans concerned about the potential consequences fracking might pose to drillers, frack waste haulers, the public, and the environment. Noble's articles have also been featured in Desmog, Audubon, National Geographic, Time, and Newsweek. Noble holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth and Ocean Sciences from Duke University and a Master of Arts degree in Earth and Environmental Science from Columbia University. Join me, your host, Buck Fantastic for a super scary journey into the world of oil and natural gas drilling on the Mothman and the Bible Belt podcast. I guarantee y'all be limiting the drill baby drill bull dinky to the privacy of your own bedroom after listening to this. Justin, what is horizontal oil and gas drilling, aka fracking? When did it begin and why should we fear it? Yeah, that's the question, right? So, um... So West Virginia, you're not far away from Titusville, Pennsylvania, which is this infamous spot where in 1859, what's regarded as the first commercial oil well in the United States was drilled, um, meaning oil was brought to the surface. It had come to the surface before, but in this case, it was brought to the surface and it was going to be used to, um, to make money and, and run industry. Um, and that was a conventional well. Um, And often we, and that just means a normal well and conventional wells really geologically, the importance there is the oil, when you stick down a well and tap it, you tap this little pocket in the ground where oil or where gas has accumulated and it shoots right up to the surface, right? Uh, We don't have to do a lot of kind of extravagant work to bring it up. You just dig a hole, you hit the deposit, And essentially it splurts up and and that's referred to as conventional oil and gas. That's what we've been tapping since that uh, example in 1859, over 150 years now. Unconventional oil and gas or horizontal oil and gas fracking, that's referring to these layers where the oil and gas is trapped really tight, right? Uh, And these are actually the mother load oil and gas layers. So think back to the conventional layer I just described where you you dug the well in, it hit the layer, and it and it splurts out under pressure. That actually is not the layer that formed that oil and gas. That oil and gas was typically formed in what's called the black shale layer, the mother load layer. These layers form oil and gas. They're formed at the bottom of uh, shallow, warm, shallow seas, right? What you'd find these days in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, dead marine algae and other organic material accumulates at the bottom, gets compacted over time, and you're going to form eventually, when buried under many years and a lot of pressure, you're going to form oil and gas. That oil and gas may seep out of these layers and collect in these pockets. And when you tap those pockets, boom, the oil splurts up, the gas splurts up at pressure. That's conventional. With unconventional, we're going to the mother load. So we're going to, in the case of West Virginia, the Marcellus or the Utica, we're going to these black shales. And these are the layers that seeded, that sent into the rock formations higher up, the oil and gas that we've been tapping for many, many years. But now we've got to crack it out of this mother load layer where it's stuck really tight. Um, And that's hard to do. And so to do that, you have to frack it, what we call, you know, the modern techniques of fracking. So you drill down to it, 
vertically, and then you drill horizontally into it, and you do this really intensive industrial operation called for, you know, that we now refer to as fracking. Um, there's different types of fracking, but that's now come to define the word fracking. Um, and, and that's what we do to bring it to the surface. So the second part of your question, why do you fear it? Because that is a really, really complicated operation. It involves massive amounts of water, you know, which you're using. How much water, water. exactly? Uh, a million to two million gallons per well, or much more in many cases. Um, and that, um, you know, that can be a problem in Oklahoma and Texas where it's really dry. And even in West Virginia where it's a lot wetter, it can be a problem because you're going to be drawing from, you know, creeks where people might be fishing and, and water quality and water levels are really important from local lakes um, or even from the Ohio River, which, you know, isn't inexhaustible. Um, but even more uh, worrisome, and the water is worrisome, but even more worrisome, in my opinion, when it comes to some of the environmental issues in the West Virginia area are the chemicals that you're going to use in the frack job and you're going to put them back into the earth, you know, uh, as part of this process, as part of this part of this rock cracking apart process. And these are um, these are some of the chemicals that often the industry um, slaps a, propri a proprietary label on, so they're not going to release what's even in these chemicals. But of the chemicals we know, you know, they're worrisome enough. I mean, there are all sorts of different acids. Essentially, what you're doing, you want to break rock open. So you're putting a lot of nasty stuff. You also want to make things slippery. So you're putting like lubricants and surfactants. Um, like the worst stuff in the bottom of your sink, the industry will often say, well, it's the same stuff in, in like a kitchen sink. And then there's other chemicals that I'm not even aware of that are used to kind of perfect the sand mixture and perfect some of these other compounds so they can interact with the rock formations in such a way that the rock will become looser, will become more easy to crack. Um, and, and the problem is um, many fold, but many of these chemicals are gonna remain in the area where you actually are doing that frack, right? And this is really the genius of the, um, the, the evil genius of the Halliburton loophole. We hear about this a lot in the oil and gas um, you know, community and in the community of people who are concerned about the environment, concerned about climate change, they mention the Halliburton loophole. What that actually is doing, it's allowing a fracked well to not become an injection well because we have this very formal way of regulating the putting down into the earth of chemicals, right? That's called the underground injection control program and EPA tries to keep a handle on that. And if you think about fracking, we have all these chemicals that I just laid out, we're shoving them under the earth, right? So technically that's an injection well. And if it is an injection well, it has to follow all these protocols under the EPA. So what the Halliburton loophole does is say, no, 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 actually it's not an injection well. Even though we're shoving all these chemicals into the earth, we're not going to call this an injection well. Uh, we're going to, you know, it's going to be something else. And, and that um, gives fracking a massive buy when it comes to all sorts of environmental uh, regulations they otherwise would have to follow. Um, that's the beginning of why we have to be worried. Um, there's more to come, but um, we can leave that one there for now. In your 2020 Rolling Stone article, you wrote about oil and gas waste trucker, Peter, not his real name, who collected four brine samples for testing. The brine samples contain combined radium levels that range from 3,500 to one that was 8,500. Is this the norm among most brine and waste samples tested for radium from the Marcellus shell? Or is this like a one-off fluke? Right, right. Great question. So we actually know that that is um, about the norm. And if anything, those levels are a little bit less than uh, the records that we have for the Marcellus. And the best record we have of late comes from a study that Pennsylvania did. Uh, they refer to it as their 2016 T-norm report. It's by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And the average radium levels in Marcellus brine in this Pennsylvania, this is a state study, um, were 9,331 picocuries per liter. 
So Peter's levels were below that. And the high number in this Pennsylvania study was 28,500 picocuries per liter. So it's a good question. Folks might be like, well, yeah, was this a fluke? Is this higher than usual? Well, no, actually, if you compare it at least to that Pennsylvania data set, which is taking from Southwestern and across PA, you know, relatively the same area um, that you're fracking there in Northwestern West Virginia, um, they're lower. Um, it's not a fluke and Marcellus levels across the board. I've seen uh, test results from another Brian Haller uh, from that same sweet spot part of the Marcellus uh, and they're roughly in the same range as, as Peter. So um, we can expect anything from like 5,000 to almost 30,000 picocuries per liter in the Marcellus. What's safe? Safe according to the EPA when it comes to drinking water is five picocuries per liter. Um, now you might What's not like in West Virginia. What's the, um, so that's, that's federal, that's a federal standard. So the EPA is no, really but in West Virginia. Like what's the worst that you've seen? The worst that I've seen in West in Virginia. Radio. Yeah. Right. No, great question there. It's kind of a trick answer because in West Virginia, I don't have a lot of data because the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection has not studied radium and the radioactivity issue, at least that I've seen publicly in the way that Pennsylvania has. So we have some data because Pennsylvania has looked. West Virginia um, just hasn't looked. And so we don't know. I, what I know from West Virginia comes from brine haulers, from workers, who have you know um, sneakily taken samples such as Peter um, and had it tested themselves. And some of Peter's samples were from West Virginia. So that gives me us a little window. I, I wish the state would do a better job of um, you know classifying what their brine was. Does the government require the oil and gas industry and in any state to regularly test brine and sludge for radioactivity? Yeah, that is it. That is so good. No, it does not. It does not. There are no federal regulations on the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas. Doesn't fall under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, doesn't fall under the EPA. Um, they're, they're not. It's it's just a, a black hole. That's scary. I want to talk about the now idled Antero Clearwater Fracking Waste Facility in Pensboro, West Virginia. They yeah. use a thermal oxidizer to treat the waste. It's ineffective for disposing of radon, which is formed from decaying uranium found in the Marcellus shell. Do you know if anyone has done any testing around the facility to see if any pollutants found their way into the soil or nearby streams? Yeah, and I'm just wondering, did you ever get a chance to see this facility in action yourself? the clear water. No. Um, yeah, this was something to see. I saw it a number of times. It's now been shut down. Um, or at least, you know, the state regards it as formally shut down. But but it would look like when you passed it, it would, it's a very complicated system of tanks and tubes, and it would be emitting massive amounts of steam, massive amounts of grayish, whitish steam. Um, and and yeah, the question you're asking is 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 the perfect question to ask. So they're they're processing brine. They claim to be cleaning it. And if you read their own engineering report, which I have, they're they're essentially using the plant like a giant tea kettle. And when their engineer spoke in the community back in 2015, and Taro gave this talk, um, and he actually referred to it, the plant's going to be like a very expensive tea kettle. Um, or you could think of this like whiskey distilling, right? Like, what are you doing in whiskey distilling? You're keeping the solids and you're getting the water off, you know? Um, so are they, were they steaming radioactive fracking waste or even quote treated radioactive fracking waste? It seems from their own engineering report that they were steaming treated radioactive fracking waste. Well, did, how much of the radioactivity and the toxic heavy metals did they remove? Um, we don't necessarily know, um, but was it out there in that plume and did it fall back on the land? That's the question you're asking. It's a mm -hmm. really good question. No one I know of has systematically 
looked. Um, but that would be like such a cool project for even, I mean, a, a, you know, a good high school teacher could have their students do that. You would go in the area. There's a little community called Greenwood just below the plant right off Highway 50. Um, you know, and you could test backyards in Greenwood. You could test streams and puddles um, for some of the things we know to be in brine, like radium, like arsenic. And you could compare them to background levels in that area. Um, and you could and you could go downwind maybe and you could go upwind of the plan and try and figure out did stuff fall out that should be done I mean that's a project the state should be doing but a local university or high school could do it too and we would learn the answer to this question how much did that plant emit in 2016 a truck hauling oil and gas waste overturned in Barnesville Ohio 5,000 gallons of the waste was released into the area and it contaminated one of three of the village's reservoirs. Is this commonplace? Yeah, the, uh, brine truck crashes are certainly commonplace. And I think that incident that you just mentioned um, sheds light on just how commonplace they are. They're common enough that one randomly crashed essentially into a reservoir. Um, and I mean, you know, there's a lot of roads across northern Appalachia. They're not all right next to reservoirs. So they're crashing a lot. But what the heck are the chances that one would crash right next to a drinking supply? Well, it did happen. Um, and there's uh, there's other incidences. I'm thinking of one. I can't remember if this is West Virginia and Ohio. A track, a truck crashed on a road called Bear Run Road. So folks could look this incident up. And the truck rolled down off Bear Run Road and landed under someone's home um, and, and it smashed against the side of their home. It woke people up and then was leaking brine under their home. So these trucks are regularly crashing. And if you go along Highway 50, which you know connect, runs through the northern part of West Virginia and then hits the Ohio border, um, I, I mean, if you sat there for long enough, you could see a brine truck crash. They're regularly crashing along that road. Besides West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, where is fracking taking place across the country? Right. So you've got a massive play in western North Dakota. Uh, that's the Bakken Formation, which is being drilled into there. You have a huge uh, play in West Texas and Southeast New Mexico. That's the Permian. Uh, and this, um, this play is producing um, more oil, really, than uh, any other play in the country. Uh, the Bakken is up there as well. Um, but the Marcellus and Utica uh, in northern Appalachia is producing more gas. Um, it's a massive gas play. Um, but then we also have plays in northwestern Arkansas. Um, we have plays in northern Louisiana. We have the, the conventional plays across Louisiana and Oklahoma, many of them which are now kind of being like re-drilled with the techniques of fracking. Um, and we have new um, new plays in Oklahoma that are being um, you know fracked. Oklahoma and northern Texas, really kind of like the birthplace of this technique. Again, conventional oil and gas goes back hundreds of years, but it's in northern Texas and Oklahoma oil fields where drillers really perfected um, this new method that we described, going down, going horizontally, cracking things open. And then there's also, you know, there's fracking in California. Fracking is another sort of, or sorry, California is another like birthplace of the oil and gas industry. Um, many folks don't necessarily think of of it as an oil and gas state, but it's a but in the central part of California, um, the Valley area, there's a really extensive um, oil field, um, and there's fracking there. Now in California, you hear about their droughts happening a lot. Is the state allowing drillers to use California water, or are they requiring that drillers go out of state and bring water into the state? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And I California is one of the states where I have not focused as much attention. So I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, what I do know is that in California, they're using produced water to, um, they're, you know, treating it, they say that they are treating it, and they're using it uh, in in crop production. And, and it is exactly because, you know, they have such water issues there. Um, and, and they're touting this thing, the people who are doing it are touting this as a great thing, it's recycling the water. And I but I know that um, Food and Water Watch and other environmental groups are very concerned about this. I mean, they're growing food, you know, grapes that we're all buying at the grocery store if they're coming from California. 
that are grown with oil field produced water. But it's not, uh, there's been so many issues. That's an important one, but I just haven't probed it. But I know that some of the environmental groups that have are really worried about that practice, certainly. Yeah, I heard about uh, they used those halo oranges. They were using frack water on them in California. Yeah, right. There certainly was a type of orange as well. Yeah, in that list. You hear about horizontal wells rupturing or going dry after being fracked. In West Virginia, activists have said that many oil and gas drillers are fracking the wells without the cement casing being hard or the cement is defective. Is there a uniform cement being talked about that all oil and gas drillers must use when fracking wells? That's a that's a really great question. It's a bit out of my territory, also, so I don't um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that you know one issue that does come up in my reporting is is that all cement will eventually crack, and so that um, you know you even if you have a cement job that can withstand the initial fracking, the operation itself, over time, you're eventually going to have a leaky well because, you know, just cement doesn't last a thousand or even a hundred years. Um, but I don't know that, you know, is there like a set standard for the wells in West Virginia? Um, I, I'm just not a, aware of, you know, Or a national standard, really. That's right, what yeah. we talked about. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure there's, you know, there's literature on that, but it's, it's not the stuff that I've been reading. In February, in Dallas Pike, West Virginia, around the Tridelphia area, PETA Enterprises truck stop cleaning station and oil and gas waste processing facility caught fire. You reported on it. It contained tanks and sludge pits. Two people were badly burned. What happened in the aftermath? The West Virginia DHHR said there was no radiation problem at this site. Is that still the case? Yeah, this is this is just an example of, you know, the public will hear what is the buzzworthy environmental issue. And the environmental issues that that pub the public and newspaper editors just like aren't informed about, they're just going to go right under. I mean, no one, you know, yeah, I wrote about that. I was really worried about that. But for a lot of people, the world of oil field waste is kind of an invisible world. And so that incident really didn't get a lot of coverage at all. Um, and the regulators didn't give it a lot of attention at all. And so we don't really know exactly what was released, which is unfortunate because there certainly should have been a formal study to figure out what burnt up there. I mean, we know that the pits that, that you know, were part of that conflagration can often be filled with some of the most radioactive sludges in the whole industry. I mean, this the, the radioactivity can accumulate in the solids, it can accumulate in the bottom of a tank in a pit in places like that, and all that caught fire. Um, and when the, when the state refers to, oh, there wasn't radioactivity, what happened um, is the uh, one of the owners of the facility went around with a handheld radio radioactivity detector and said, "Oh, um, you know, it's fine. We didn't we didn't have high levels." And the state's saying, "Well, look, we that's what we're relying on. Well, really, we're going to let them self-report that it was fine and not um, do any sort of you know analysis beyond that." Um, so it, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's a major lapse of the state's regulatory apparatus that they just let a radioactive oil field waste treatment center go up in flames and then didn't even look at all to see what the heck just happened and what might have burnt up in the process. It's tragic. Is there a high instance of lung and bone cancer among oil and gas drillers and truck drivers? Yeah, so you're asking all the right questions. I would suspect that one might find that, but uh, people haven't looked. And that's something I hope to change with my reporting. I hope to help engage the medical community uh, and the health community um, and the academic parts of, of those disciplines to really start analyzing some of these questions um, because um, it's, it's just, um, I mean, one of the most concerning things to me, one of the most, you know, I think, worrisome things in the reporting is that oil field workers, when they complain to their physicians about various symptoms they're getting, 
are either ignored, are told they're crazy, are told that these things, which are in many cases very clearly related to environmental exposures, they're told that they're connected to, you know, really absurd things um, that have nothing to do with the condition they're complaining about. They're really just disregarded. And that's that's really unfortunate. What should be happening is the state should be recognizing that there are risks. They should be recognizing that workers are often vocalizing them. And then they should do a study, just like the study that you, you know, mentioned, and look to see if there are um, cancers and other issues occurring in higher incidence. But OSHA or no one's doing that? No, not that I'm aware of. At a talk in Youngstown, Ohio, you talked about radon degrading into radioactive lead and coming up with grime. How radioactive is this substance compared to the radium itself? Right. So what um, what's happening with the radioactivity that comes up in oil and gas development and why it's an issue is the radioactivity is being concentrated. So often when I talk, you know, industry representatives will say, well, you're just confusing these poor people. Radioactivity is all around us. Um, and it's true. It is. We live on a mildly radioactive planet. The, um, the soil around us and within some of the food and within our own body, there's, there's small amounts of radioactivity. But what the oil and gas process is so good at doing is concentrating this natural radioactivity in a variety of different ways. So the brine can concentrate radium. Um, this really interesting geologic um, way in which, you know, radium from underground ends up being really concentrated in oil field brine and brine can have this high signature of radium. Well, radium, or at least one isotope of radium, radium-226, um, the direct daughter is radon. That means when radium-226 does this thing that radioactive elements do, which is blast off a bit of radiation, it loses, radium loses this little piece of itself uh, and it's now become literally another element. And in the case of radium-226, it's become radon-222. And radon, um, radium is a scary radioactive element, a worrisome one, because it can move with water. Unlike uh, you know many metals, radium is quite soluble and it can move with water, uh, which makes it transportable, right? So it can come up with brine, it can go places. Radon is worrisome for different reasons. Radon is a gas, which also makes it very mobile. So it's these mobile radioactive elements um, which end up being, you know, really concerning. And radon also will quickly decay to other radioactive elements. And you mentioned one of them, uh, ra radioactive isotopes of lead. And radi uh, radon is like incredible. It just goes through like boom, 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 this very quick series of decays each time, of course, blasting off radiation, becoming a new element. And it can end up becoming um, over the long term, um, it will become lead 210, which is a radioactive isotope of lead, and then that eventually will become polonium 210. Polonium is one of the most worrisome uh, elements uh, or compounds, any material uh, on Earth. Polonium is what was used to uh, murder the former Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko by putting, you know, little dollop, less than a grain of sand, in his tea at a at a London hotel bar. I think it was 2006. Um, and, and those two elements, lead-210, polonium-210, they're going to be accumulating downstream um, in the oil and gas production system. So finally getting to you know, the heart of your question, well, are these levels dangerous? Yeah, they can be really dangerous because they end up accumulating on things like pipeline valves and filters, these things within the pipeline system at very high levels. You just think of your sink, right? Like you might have a little bit of sediment in your water and it's not a lot, but the valve or the trap in your sink is going to catch like all that stuff. And that's what's happening in the natural gas system at places where stuff, where gunk is trapped. Um, the radioactivity levels can be enormous. How far can the radioactive dust found at natural gas sites travel? And does it degrade at a quicker rate or is it in the environment for thousands of years? Yeah, yeah, really good um, questions. And we really don't know the answer to the first part, at least yet. I mean, if we, you know, one, um, one big concern is that we have radon, this radioactive element we were just talking about. We, we know this comes up with natural gas. We know this from the industry's own reports on oil and gas production, that there will be radon in the gas stream coming up at the wellhead. 
okay, so we're flaring gas, right, at the wellhead. Um, you know, you drive by, you see those the fire like shooting out at night. Um, and when a well is being, you know, com the completion process after a frack job, I mean, there could be a massive flare going on. Well, is there radon in that flare? If radon's in the gas and gas is being flared, yeah, there must be radon coming up with a flare. How much is coming up? Um, where are these daughters, these radioactive elements that radon then becomes, where are they falling out? Those are things that we just don't know yet. Um, so how far does it go? We don't necessarily know, but researchers are starting to probe that topic. Harvard just last year uh, came out with a study where they looked at these Cold War radioactivity monitoring stations that are planted around the US. And this was done, you know, well before fracking back in the 50s. They're still there and there's a lot of data there. And Harvard looked at like all this data across the country of these stations and was able to determine that when they were located downwind of fracking sites, they tended to pick up a little bit more radioactivity, enough to be statistically significant. So that's like the beginning of an answer. Wow, looks like fracking is putting more radioactivity into the air. And it seems like it's going actually pretty far because these sites aren't necessarily right next to a frac pad. They're many miles away. Um, but we still have to go like the next step with the research and really like canvas the ground much closer and determine just how much is coming up, just where it's settling, um, you know, and just how, um, worrisome uh, some of these path possible exposure pathways might be. West Virginia has a lot of farmland. Many farmers own surface rights, but not mineral rights. Some West Virginia farmers have fracking taking place on their property. Do you know if many West Virginia farmers are having their soil tested for possible contamination? Yeah, so that, yeah, so good. Um, you're leading, you know, to all the appropriate places. I mean, I wish the West Virginia DP was asking these questions and then following up on them. Um, so what we know is that in Louisiana, where we've had oil and gas production occur at a really, you know, steady clip across many parts of the state for decades, um, there's a group of landowners now, you know, often farmers, similar to what you're describing in West Virginia, not big factory farms. These are individual landowners. They own a bit of land. Um, and their land, and they had oil and gas on their land, and they liked that because they got some money while you know production was going on. Uh, but now that's done, and they've got a well sitting there, and they're realizing that their land has become contaminated with toxic heavy metals and with radioactivity. Uh, and these lawsuits, and they are now suing because they're like, this wasn't part of the deal. These are referred to as legacy lawsuits. Um, and there's over 350 of them in the state of Louisiana. So what we know is that in another oil and gas state, on, land, on farmland where there was oil and gas production, there was massive contamination, massive contamination left in pits, left in spills, left in all sorts of different ways. And we know in West Virginia, some of these same, you know, some of the same patterns of development happened. There are pits, there were spills. So, I would suspect that there's huge contamination on a lot of the farmland uh, where oil and gas development occurred. Um, I don't think there's been a systematic assessment of that just yet. And, and that's, you know, I, I mean, hopefully reporters and, and researchers can take, you know, can take this issue there and or farmers themselves can um, go out and find ways to, you know, test um, some of this material because something, you know, really like, it's just, you know, the the industry is quite sloppy, right? And I think this is, the regulators seem to refuse to admit this, but I mean, they can write all the perfect pretty regulations they want on paper. The industry is going to like smash right over all of that. It's quick and it, and it's, you know, and it's spilling over the edges and it has to be because it's this fast paced world that's really sloppy, that's bringing up all sorts of waste and they just got to keep moving, right? So I've heard so many stories from workers, you know, about how they'll just completely devastate someone's farmland and they're just like, yo, yo, let's call up the gravel guy and get the gravel to come. And, and they just like, they, they rub dirt over it, they pour dirt over it, they pour gravel over it. Um, so how often has that happened on, Virgi on West Virginia farmland? And, and what's, you know, what messes are out there that have just been um, poured over with gravel and dirt as the industry kind of moves right on? Um, you know, I've certainly heard a lot of stories, anecdotes from workers of that happening. Um, and, you know, it would really take the state to do a full assessment and, and be like, well, 
let's just see what really went down here. Well, you hear um, people talking about E. coli and salmonella poisoning being a problem when it comes to farming, but you don't hear people talking about these other kind of contamination issues, which people should be talking about, especially when you have so much land in West Virginia, which is being used for farming. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly you should be. And, um, um, you know, I don't know an easy way to start doing that assessment other than just building awareness across the board, you know. So um, someone who's, you know, parents may have been farmers and had fracking on their land. Uh, maybe the parents just never were were worried about it or focused on it, but maybe the next generation can be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> We had a Marcellus well in our land. We had a Utica well. Like, let's let's see what actually happened here, um, and start looking into it. Here's something super scary: a 2019 Natural Resources Defense Council report stated the West Virginia DEP had problems with reporting, lax regulations, and often sidestep the state underground injection control program and the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. Also, the West Virginia DEP allowed companies to dump oil and gas waste without permit into ejection wells and allowed the companies to inject after DEP sent an order stopping it. Fifteen abandoned wells were unplugged. One injection well had high pressure problems. No record of violation notice was given. Another injection well the Jones 1 in Kanawha County and the Conley 3 injection well in Roan County lack cement casing to protect groundwater. Have you seen more of this from the West Virginia DEP in your reporting? Or better yet, other state environmental regulatory agencies? Yeah. This is super uh, scary. It is, you know, and when people in a community learn that an, an injection well is coming to their community, they typically... Um, when they perk their ears up, they are scared. And the government is there to say, oh, don't be scared. We do this thing called injection so well. It's all regulated and it's there's thousands of wells all across the country and it's going to be fine. Well, no, that's complete bullshit. It's not going to be fine. There's really, when you look into it, and I have with the book that I'm writing now, there's no science. I mean, not just very little. There is no science at all to say that when you inject massive amounts of fluid, toxic fluid with unknown chemical signatures at high pressure into the earth, there's no like, you know, vaults beneath the earth, right? Where like you open the door, you press the code, and then you just put the stuff there like a bag at a bus station. No, what you're doing is you're injecting waste into a porous layer, a layer, a rock layer with pore space that already holds like maybe water or maybe some form of gas. It's, you know, it's a porous layer. It can hold stuff, but it's already holding something, right? Um, and, and the injected waste push, pushes that stuff out of the way. So it can take the place. And, and you're just constantly like cramming stuff down into this rock layer, which maybe can hold some stuff, but is being crammed to hold more. And it's eventually like going this way, going that way, and going ways we have no idea because we don't have sensors and cameras down there. It's a complete unknown. So yeah, eventually um, things break, whether it's the casing itself, if the injection well is poorly constructed, that's an easy one to break first. But even if you have, you know, really secure casing, the well's been appropriately dug. The idea that an injected layer, an injection layer can hold this waste is absurd. It can't. It inevitably, by nature of design, is pushing out somewhere, which means eventually it is leaking somewhere, whether that leak happens within a couple years or a couple thousand years remains to be seen, but all injection wells will leak. And in Ohio, what we have is we have a number of injection wells receiving huge amounts of fracking waste that are leaking into conventional gas wells. This is happening. The state has written reports about it. Um, and we know now of at least two different instances, two different parts of Ohio, where we have injected fracking waste leaking through miles. In, in, in one case, at least four and a half miles, this waste has traveled horizontally through the earth and then half a mile up to leak into an old gas well. Um, and if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. Like where is the waste first gonna splash out? Um, well, it's gonna be in another place where you've dug a hole into the earth and, and there's a lot of gas wells across West Virginia, across Ohio. So these are the places to look. 
Um, so yeah, it, it, we do have examples. The ones I just said, there's also examples in Oklahoma and other states of injection wells leaking. Um, and they all will leak and this will continue to be a problem into the future uh, and and it's so important to stress you know because the industry has a massive problem with dealing with this waste right injection has been such a nice way to do it i mean it literally is sweeping it under the carpet we're injecting it under the carpet getting it rid of you know getting it out of the public site but i think it's so important the public be aware that it's a bullshit way it's gonna leak and you should do everything you can when a company comes to town saying we want to dig an injection or we want to turn an old gas Those were decades a years old just so you know right you know, right exactly right what's that the, the two the two that i named from canaan roan county they were like old like pre-fracking pre-fracking yeah because we had to we had to, we had injection wells before fracking um because the conventional wells you know they produce brine too we had to dispose of that and the, the way deemed appropriate has been an injection well but um yeah i'm just getting animated here because i'm telling folks you know like this is where you need to fight um mm -hmm. because it's not a safe practice and the government will do everything they can to convince you that they have a handle on it they have no handle on it and this is really one of the most criminal parts of oil and gas development in my opinion this idea of injection wells no from what i've read you can only get about 90 percent of radium 226 and radium 22a out of water is there any other process that can completely get rid of that from water or right right yeah so it's it's really um difficult to clean uh, oil field brine. Uh, and if we're talking about fracking, we can, we can, you know, we're often dealing with brine, but it's mixed in if it's flow back, which is the early part of the brine stream comes up after the frack job, it's mixed in with other chemicals, we can just call it fracking waste. It's really gunky stuff, it can have all sorts of chemicals unnatural chemicals, you know, human made ones shot down with the frack, but it also has a lot of natural salts, huge amounts of salts. Um, and it has different heavy metals, it has radioactivity, right? And the salts end up really like gunking up any sort of um, cleaning process you have. A lot of times you remove things by like changing pH or changing um, salt balance. That's how you like pull chemicals out in all sorts of different industrial processes. But you, because brine is so like gunked up with salt and other elements, it, it's really difficult to work with. And so it's really difficult to use some of these treatment techniques and simply remove things. The salts will get in the way. So it's very hard to treat um, brine to treat fracking waste and remove the radioactivity. It can be done. Uh, and I think you brought up, you know, like the example where one plant was removing 90% of it, which still leaves you with 10%. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, from what I've read, you can, um, you can remove all the radium. You can design a system that would be able to remove all the radium. You'd have to have a multi-tiered process where first you remove the salts, you remove other things, and eventually you get to the radium. But that would be enormously expensive. Um, and I haven't seen um, anyone in the Marcellus area who has done that successfully. There might be a plan out there that's done it. And if they have, uh, if there is, you know, please call me and you can explain to me how you've done it. Um, I think it's possible, certainly, to do it, but at enormous cost. Uh, and many, many cases where you've had companies that have tried to do it, say they could do it, say they are doing it, but failed doing it. Now, even if you successfully remove all the radium from Marcellus brine or Utica brine, um, you have a new problem, right? You've inherently just concentrated it. So congratulations, like you removed all the radium. What are you gonna do with this concentrated removed radium? Because you now have like a major radioactivity disposal issue on your hand. Um, and I, that's a question I have not heard answered either. In 2019, you wrote a piece in Rolling Stone about Enbridge's Texas Eastern Transmission Pipeline that exploded in Noble County, Ohio, and in Salem Township, Pennsylvania. On December 11, 2012, in Sissonville, West Virginia, a Columbia gas transmission pipeline exploded after a 20-inch piece of pipe ruptured. Flames shot 80 to 90 feet in the air. The devastation destroyed four homes, damaged five homes, and melted an 800-foot stretch of road on nearby I-77. 
It melted siding on homes hundreds of feet from the site. The cause of the ruptured pipe, corrosion, and lack of inspections. In the aftermath, the West Virginia Public Service Commission released several pages of violations by Columbia Gas and Citizenville alone including failure to inspect valves and failure to take steps to prevent accidental ignition. You hear about oil leaks and pipelines occurring frequently, but not a lot of about these natural gas leaks occurring in major pipelines. I mean, how common are these deadly natural gas leaks in the United States? Well, yeah, the explosions like the ones you're reading about, um, there was a period uh, and maybe we're still in it in the Marcellus Utica area where you were having like one or two a year and, and we're talking about either deadly or near deadly ones where pipelines were exploding in the vicinity of homes. Um, and the that article that you referenced there, um, which I wrote for Rolling Stone, I do give a link um, to a site that lists all of the ongoing pipeline incidents it, um, across the country. And that, you know, uh, with uh, some quick research, people can find that. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's quite a lot. There are quite a lot of incidences occurring regularly. Those ones are really concerning because they're, they're so close to people. And they're also so just visually, like insane. I mean, the fireball when a when these lines explodes are huge. You know, they jet high up into the into the into the sky um, and, and they burn at a really intense rate. And it's it often can be hard to, you know, control the fireball. Um, you know, eventually they can turn the gas off. Um, so I, I don't think there's been enough good. There's been some good journalism around this issue, but I think there's room for more. There's certainly room for more because we need to know why um, it seems like these explosions have occurred at a higher clip in northern Appalachia. Um, and certainly an answer that's come to me from the workers is a lot of these people who do these jobs are coming from Texas, they're coming from Oklahoma, they're coming from flat places, and they don't know how to put pipelines in through the very steep hills and hollers of West Virginia and southwestern PA. Now that's, you know, anecdotes coming from workers, I, I trust it, but it's, you know, not backed up with a scientific analysis yet to say, well, is that the case? Are we having um, structural issues with putting pipelines in through this really rough terrain? It makes sense to me, but I think well, that's another- Well, Citizensville is just a hop, skip, and a jump from where I live in Charleston. That's the scary thing, you know? Right, so they're close to big population centers. And and that's, um, you know, you bring up a good point. It's only a matter of time if we have these incidences and we don't have analysis on why we're having them, we'll keep having them. And until we have one that's in an even bigger populated area. Um, so it's really, um, you know, it's overlooked part of the industry. Um, and what's worrisome, I think, is these pipelines have gone in, in many cases, really quick. Um, they're trying to get things done with, you know, while they still have the permit time or while they still have the political capital or the money or just do it quickly. Um, and I think there's room for um, negligence there. And we've certainly had enough pipeline explosions that, you know, a closer look needs to be taken and seen, well, how the heck have all these things been put in? Uh, and, and do we have structural integrity issues across others that we haven't noticed yet? You wrote that Shell Oil knew as far back as 1950 of the association between its gasoline and cancer of the bone and bone marrow. Do you know if Shell took any precautions with their workforce handling the radioactive petroleum? Yeah, good question. I um, that is is incredible document you're referring to, which I think I link in one of my Desmog pieces. Um, 1950. It's a bunch of Shell researchers uh, putting out this little like letter on talk on the toxicity of oil and gas. Um, and there's this amazing line in that letter where they where they pin most cancers known to um, to oil and gas related products. I mean, they're essentially saying that oil and gas and things connected to it are causing most of the cancers we know of in this country, which is astonishing. That's just, you know, we've swept right over all of that. Um, did Shell like let the people they're working with um, 
uh, the people working for them know about this letter? I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't have any of the backstory, unfortunately, of, of exactly where that letter came from. I know it came from a research lab they have. I think it was in Emeryville, California. You know, a lot of these big major oil and gas companies have research labs and they do research and it came out of that. Um, but I have no idea how they did or didn't work that through their own um, workforce. But what I do know is certainly the people that I'm connected with now who are often doing oil and gas service work for companies like Shell, they are not aware of that document. West Virginia is one of several states using the ICER, which contains brine on our roads. Do you know if any states are actually testing this stuff before it's actually being applied to the road? Right. I, I believe some states do some testing. Like I know Michigan, where brine spreading has been a practice for decades, um, certain things are tested for, but no state uh, is testing for radioactivity. No state is testing for radium. Um, and even typically heavy metals like arsenic and lead, which are really worrisome also, they're not being tested for. So, um, so yeah, no, no. The, the radioactivity component is not being tested for across the board. And you also wrote commercial de-icers contain the uh, brine. Do you know which yeah. brand specifically that people should be on the lookout for? Yeah, there's a there's a company called Nature's Own Source, which is producing a product called Aqua Selena that was, uh, at least for a time, being sold at popular hardware stores in Ohio, such as a Lowe's in Akron, Ohio. Um, and this product was tested by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, and the and it was tested for radium. It's great that they did this testing, and the readings, you know, were um, in my opinion astronomical. I mean, they were in the thousands of picocuries per liter range for radium. Um, again, the safe drinking water limit is five, so they'll say, "Oh, well, we're, no one's drinking this product." Well, that doesn't matter. You're pouring it on people's sidewalks and patios and driveways. Um, and it has these radium levels, not just above the safe drinking water limit, but the, above, for example, the discharge limit that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, mandates that facilities it oversees uh, abide by. So just to like unpack that, what does that mean? That means a nuclear power plant has a limit for how much radium it can put into the environment, right? And it can't discharge radium. Uh, it cannot discharge a stream of waste that contains radium greater than 600 picocuries per liter for radium-226 or radium-228. These are the most common radium isotopes, you know, in both of these industries. So can't over 600, can't do over 600 for the other type of radium. Um, but yet this brine, this aquasalina, had radium above those limits. So were that, were that brine, were that product being sold at Lowe's coming out of a nuclear power plant, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would say, no, you can't do that. Um, that is too high, and yet uh, it's allowed to be sold in stores. So it, it's just a you, it's a glaring example of the massive black hole of this topic that it just you know this project has been allowed to walk through, um, and and the people producing it I should say are convinced that their product is fine. It's slapped with a label that says environmentally safe, you know, for for pets. Um, I think it says for children and pets. So um, it's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah. Do I know of others? Um, that's a great question. There is no testing that I'm aware of that's looked across this industry and said, wow, who else is making de-icer, you know, patio sidewalk de-icer from oil filled waste? I mean, other people should answer that question because we know of one company prominently doing it. Are there others? I'm not sure, but it's a great question to ask. Besides the horizontal drilling, conventional drilling has problems of its own, correct? So, right. Um, it, it's a good question to ask, follow up to the one you just did, because there's an important point. Uh, this Aqua Selena product was not being made from fracking waste. Um, it was being made from conventional brine, brine from a conventional well. So we don't have to worry about the fracking chemicals, one would think there, right? We're just dealing with this, quote, natural brine. But the problem, as the Ohio Department of Natural Resources numbers indicate, is that this brine still has quite high levels of radium. So um, the, the teaching point here is 
heavy metals, and radium can be high, not just in brine from frack wells, but in brine from conventional wells. And again, going back to you know 1859, Titusville, Pennsylvania, first commercial oil well in the US, it produced brine. There has been brine all along with this industry, and many wells produce more brine than they do oil. That brine can still have a quite high radium signature. And we know that conventional wells across the, the northern um, part, northeastern part of the U.S., so West Virginia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, we know that even the conventional wells, the radium levels can be high. West Virginia was a big coal state. There's 114 coal slurry impoundments in West Virginia. None are lined. Why is it that the EPA requires fracking waste sites to be lined, but not coal slurry impoundments? Yeah, this is such a good question. I, I mean, I've, um, you know, I've, before I started reporting heavily on fracking, I, I toured through some of West Virginia coal country and visited coal slurry impoundment, and it's, um, it's just they frequently spill over. Yeah. I mean, it's atrocious that you can have these things sitting up above communities, above valleys, um, in the mountains, as you point out, unlined, uh, not just that, like dammed in essentially with the rubble waste from the mine itself. So they're really on shaky uh, mechanical footing, unlined, so we know they're leaking. Um, and yeah, they do break. Um, it's a massive disaster just looming over various parts of the states. And, and, and yeah, I think you brought up another good point. In many instances, these things are even less regulated than things in the fracking industry, which we know are still, you know, culturally regulated. Um, it, it's an issue that, you know, needs more attention. In many people's opinions, fracking for oil and gas isn't an exact science since there's a ton of problems with it. Based on your research, do you think fracking can safely be done? No, not with like the type of human being that <laughs> exists on the planet right now, human uh, homo sapiens as we are. I mean, no, um, because it has, it, what's happening with fracking is, um, I'm just trying to take a step back in answering that question. I mean, if you were to describe what was going to happen at a fracked well to a neutral bystander, all of the chemicals, all of the industrial operations that were going to occur, again, as you point out, in farmland, in woodlands, in people's backyards, um, the clear answer, the clear analysis would be that you should never do this thing within like miles of a human being. It is a massively industrial, massively contamination prone process. Um, and it should not be done close to human beings. So no, you cannot do it safely. It, it inherently is sloppy and inherently is spilling chemicals and injecting them all over the place. Um, I know it's driving, I know it's driving people who are having the drilling done in their yard crazy because it's so damn loud. And it goes, you know, the, it goes so far beyond that. The noise is certainly an issue. You know, I've stood with homeowners, people, cool people up in Doddridge County, West Virginia, who built homes themselves, who laid out gardens, who can almost like entirely, you know, eat off their own land because they have orchards, they have vegetables, and, you know, they can hunt in the land around them. Um, and, and I've like heard what it sounds like. Fracking sounds like a jet taking off right next to you continuously, you know, for however long that process is going to be going on. It might be a week, might be two weeks, might be more. And then like a new frack pad will go up on the other side of the valley. So you've got it again. And that's just the sound. That's not even the chemical emissions, the smells and, and the lights and all the other process. So it's, it's an, it's an attack on every single sense, human sense that we have. Plus it's a physical and emotional and mental assault because you know it you cannot um withstand that you cannot as a human do your normal life and and put up with everything that fracking throws at you and and you're probably going to get sick from it and then you don't have a choice but even if somehow your body is impenetrable to all these assaults you know mentally eventually you will break down um it, it, it never should be done close to human beings. And unfortunately, it's been done right on top of them across West Virginia. Besides lead, 
besides radium-226 and 228, what heavy metals are in the brine being brought from the surface at frac sites? Yeah, there can, there can be arsenic, there can be strontium, cadmium. There can be all sorts of really interesting heavy metals. It can be lithium. Um, and this is why a, a part of the industry is like really excited about brine because they look at it for the mining of metals. Um, and again, it's a complex stream of waste that people have had difficult drawing things out of. But if you throw a lot of money at it, yeah, you will be able to extract lithium, sure. Um, and, and, and there can be potential metal recovery. Um, but that is a level that is not being done across the Marcellus. I mean, across the Marcellus, you have people trying to treat it with essentially like swimming pool technology. And you have a sloppy contamination disaster happening. Um, but, but there are these other heavy metals that are there. And if you just think about one geologist described to me what's happening with brine in the Marcellus and Utica in a really interesting way. I mean, you have a black shale, right? That's our mother load oil and gas layer. That's what we're tapping in the Marcellus and in the Utica via the techniques of fracking. Black shale, as I described earlier, being these mother load oil and gas layers, it's where the oil and gas was born. It's still stuck tight there in the rock, and we're now cracking it out. Well, these, if you think about like an activated charcoal, um, what it's doing is it's trapping minerals. I mean, that's why charcoal is good. You know, you're supposed to eat it if you're poisoned um, or in like a Brita or, or various water treatment systems. It's trapping, it, it, it gloms onto all these different metals. And so the, the shale itself has acted like a massive activated charcoal layer for millions of years. And it's trapped all sorts of really interesting minerals. Um, and including a lot of heavy metals and radioactivity. So the shale, um, one, another uh, geologist in this really cool paper from like 2011 referred to it as a garbage rock. It's just filled with everything. It traps it all. It, it's trapped all these minerals, all these heavy metals, including these radioactive ones over time. And yeah, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Um, and um, and there's you know some research papers I can link to that will go through um, complete lists. I think Dr. Bill Burgos at Penn State, in his study on brine spreading, looked at some of the other heavy metals, um, and it's you know it's a long list of a lot of concerning ones, including some of the ones I just mentioned. And last but not least, when is your book coming out, and do you have a title? Yeah, we're still, you know, tying up the loose ends. Um, and it's being published with Simon and Schuster, which is exciting. And it's a big publisher and they've got, you know, a big reach, but they also are a slow moving beast. So um, it's probably not going to be coming out till 2023. Seems like a million years from now. Um, the tentative title is Petroleum 238 Big Oil's Dangerous Sec Secret and the Grassroots Fight to Stop It. Um, but, um, you know, that is tentative. Maybe at some uh, later point we'll find something more enticing. But, um, yeah, that's the tentative title and date. Um, and, you know, stay tuned, please, because uh, I, I, when it gets closer, we'll have so much more to reveal. And I'd love to fill you in on that. Fracking is a very scary subject matter that few elected officials in drilling states want to address. The mainstream media focuses more attention on the job creation and financial gains aspect of this type of oil and natural gas drilling than the human health and workplace safety dangers it poses to the public and worker. On top of environmental and workplace safety concerns, there's also the issue of climate change as it pertains to oil and natural gas drilling in general. Neither drilling practice and the long-term use of fossil fuels is sustainable if we want to preserve life on the planet for hundreds of years to come. The discussion needs to shift from destroying Mother Earth and mankind with fossil fuels to how do we move away from fossil fuels while creating sustainable, clean energy sources that power our vehicles and homes while creating lasting, good-paying careers that won't desecrate the planet. I want to thank my special guest, Justin Noble, for giving us the 411 on fracking. I hope every one of you contacts your elected officials to discuss the dangers of fracking and conventional oil and gas drilling. Both drilling practices bring up radioactive carcinogenic gunk and contribute greatly to climate change. Where is Captain Planet when you need him? You can listen to the Mothman and the Bible Belt podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and SoundCloud. 
Check out my website, mothmanthebiblebelt.com, for updates on new podcast outlets, guest bios, and to find direct links to my social media. Thanks for listening.